everyone's settling, settled. The reason why I wait for you to settle is that because the way the microphones are set up, uh, it hears a lot of background noise. So what we try to do is just wait for everyone to settle. And for those of you who have mobile phones and everything, if you can make sure they're on silent for me, that would be great. How are we feeling today? Fine. Fine today? A lot of pain. A lot of pain for somebody? <laughs> some emotional pain for some last night, I don't know. Um, yes, some, some uh, spirits came to visit us this morning from different ones who have been controlling some of you have <laughs> come to visit me. Not very happy with me this morning. So, <laughs> so we'll have to... Uh, we had a chat with some of those, and uh, but uh, some of them didn't want to talk, they just wanted to be angry, so <laughs> that's the way it goes. Um, a lot of people do not realise how much spirit influence they are actually under, and uh, many times the spirits come, uh, when I speak, um, the spirits hear a lot of information they've never heard before either, and uh, they are often very concerned about uh, how that information will affect you, the person they are with. And they are concerned because they feel that if you listen to what I say to you about the truth about the spirit world and so forth, that there's a chance that you might work out that they are with you and influencing you quite a lot. And uh, they are concerned that if, they, if that is the case, then they might uh, lose their influence over you and so quite often I get a visit from them, usually the night after a talk or the next morning <laughs> is usually the case. And uh, quite often I've had visits from spirits from all over the world and who are with people from all over the world when I can feel those people make some shifts emotionally into that, that cause the spirits to separate from the person on earth a bit more and the spirits then see me as the cause of that occurring, not yourselves generally, so they come and have a little go at me about that. And sometimes the go at me is not that little, sometimes. It's, uh, they try to affect me physically and so forth. That's part of the territory of living in harmony with truth. Is there anything you can do to, to yourself to get rid of those uh, Of course, spirits? every time a spirit um, attacks you in some way or manipulates you in some way, there is always something emotionally open in yourself that doesn't provide the protection that it needs to provide. So, for myself at the moment, I'm working through some fears uh, regarding different matters, and, and those fears leave me open to attack. So, once, once I work through those fears emotionally, and then I'll be closed to the attack. And then whatever they try to do, they can't influence me personally. They might be able to influence others around me, but not me personally. Yeah. So over my last uh, sort of seven or eight years, I've had to work through a lot of things. Um, and, that, and those things I've worked through have finished up preventing the spirits from having much of an influence on me. Uh, they can't very much influence me anymore and push me in certain directions, but they can attack me still, because of my openness to being attacked still. Mm. Yeah. yeah, the pain I have in my shoulders and the problem I, I have had in my stomach for almost two years now, is mm. that spiritual attack? Yes, but uh, it all, all spiritual attack begins with uh, an emotion inside of yourself that is unhealed. So the pain in your shoulders is related to one group of emotions that are unhealed, in your stomach is related to another group of emotions that are unhealed. And when these emotions are unhealed, it attracts spirits. Uh, a lot of times the spirits have no idea why they are attracted to you at all. In fact, they think that something's sucking them to you. And they think that you're the problem, <laughs> rather than them being the problem. And so they don't really understand a lot of the times why they're being attracted to you. They just feel bound to you through some emotion. And, uh, and, and because of that, many times, they then become a part of your spirit, spirit body system. And uh, since they're a part of your spirit body system and they have emotions of their own, they interfere with the way the spirit body operates, which then interferes with you physically. And the only way to really cure those problems permanently is to address the cause, which are all related to our unhealed emotions within ourselves. Yeah. 
So it's all very important to. So this sort out uh, stomach is that uh, my my fear of having women and men? Uh, where it depends where in your stomach. It so takes, if. Uh, if you describe is it high up in your stomach or is it low down in your stomach? It's more the digestion is who is thinking, not in functioning good at all. Yes. Uh, usually digestion not functioning well is related to fear and terror. Um, so certainly they, they are emotions that affect you. But also emotions about worth, self-worth and worthiness. Uh, so it depends on which part of your stomach you have the digestion problems, you see. So if it's higher up in your stomach, then generally it's more related to fear-based issues mm -hmm. and usually uh, for most people if they have pro digestion problems it's, it's in both areas of their stomach. If it's lower down in the stomach a lot of times it's more related to worthiness issues, a sense of identity and self-worth. Yeah? And, uh, and if it's both of those areas then obviously <coughs> there's fear and unworthiness issues that you need to allow yourself to work through. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. If you help someone, if you help if you, someone, if you help someone, like a therapist, a therapist in the therapy, yeah, yeah, and you help them with a get rid of a some theory, mm -hmm. then is there any? Of course, it's the risk that you get it from yourself. Ah uh, yes. How and you do that too? Or um, can it happen to you that you have the theories with you? Of course. What do you do? To get rid of it. Uh, like I just described, every time a spirit attacks a person, it's to do with an emotional injury inside of the person. So, so if it's an attacking of a child, then it's to do with the emotional injury of the parent, who's primarily, or parents that are primarily connected with the child. And in every case, it's a matter of actually healing that emotional injury. Um, the reason why some spirits move from one person to the other is because when you are in a therapy role, and you, you're, you're forcing a spirit out of a person and the spirit becomes very angry and upset generally and as a result of that they want to blame somebody or harm somebody so they generally attempt to attack the person who was a part of, or the people that were a part of that process of removing the spirit from the person. So um, it also, if the person that you're helping, the, the person in the physical, doesn't address their emotional injuries then what happens is that other spirits will return and influence them anyway. So, there, unfortunately, a lot of times we move one spirit on and just to make space for another spirit to come. And then we move them on and then make space and then another spirit comes. And unless we deal with the cause of that, then we'll be going to get therapy every month uh, for moving on a different spirit. And unfortunately, a lot of people do do that. Um, and so that, that is not a like not what I'd recommend. What I'd recommend is addressing the cause, yeah, which is always emotional. So um, I think it's also a good thing to have compassion and love for them as well. Always. Like not see like I need to get rid of something. Exactly. Because they never experience love. Exactly. Most of the time. So. And a lot of times, as I pointed out, they're totally confused about yeah. why they are even connected to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they just get it. That they are a bit um, upset. Yes. It's all something like we need to get rid of something. And yeah. 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 This morning we had a chat with the spirits with Danny, Daniel. And um, those spirits uh, with him were family spirits from your ancestry. And uh, they had no idea that their connections to him were causing his physical illness. They believed that they were protecting him. And they had no idea that the physical illness was being created by their overcloaking of him. And so, um, hopefully, with the discussion, some of the discussion we had today with them, um, they will see things a bit differently. But, but it's mum's emotions that has, have created this openness for, for him to have this influence. <coughs> and so, I'd like to speak with you about your emotions at some point over the next week, uh, so you can help him to, to progress again. And to actually, now the spirits have taken so much energy from him that they're now degrading his body quite severely. And uh, once that stops, um, then um, his body can recover uh, and regrow particular problems that he faces to do with his nervous system and, uh, and to do with his brain. Uh, that's where they're affecting the most. Yeah.
But we can discuss that later, but that's a part of it. Can we use a prayer in order to go to? Sorry? Can we use a prayer? Of, okay. of course. Prayer has the effect uh, of temporarily uh, asking for God to assist a person. Now, you've got to remember that God's laws are already assisting the person. So this is where most people forget with prayer. They, they sort of think that God should uh, overcome her laws in order to heal somebody. And the truth is that God never overcomes her laws in order to heal somebody. Because her laws are all perfect and all loving and they all illustrate a problem of some kind or that a problem does exist. And so um, when we pray, we need to make sure that our prayers are in harmony with those laws that exist. So a good prayer with regard to somebody who is sick is, is to, to pray that they actually become aware of why they are sick, the actual cause as to why they are sick rather than just to try to cure them from the sickness without them understanding the reason why they were sick in the first place. In the case of a child being sick, then the parents need to address the cause of why the child got sick because it always is related to the parent. And so uh, this is something that most parents don't do. They, you know, they try to cure the child using medication of some kind, but they don't generally address the emotional reason inside of themselves that, that allowed their child to not be protected and therefore catch an illness of some kind. So again, it's to do with emotions in the parent that the parent needs to address and, and overcome. So um, if, if we pray for somebody to get well, then if we pray for that without understanding that they're sick because of already there being some disharmony with love in themselves or in, in their parents in the case of a child, then um, we're really praying for God to overcome her own laws that she's already created to expose these conditions. And so it's very important to understand that it's uh, pointless, usually, to do that. It's pointless to pray for some, somebody um, when we're asking God to overcome a law of, that God has already created. But it is wonderful to pray for somebody because they can get a lot of assistance through spirit friends and so forth that God assigns to help them. If you pray for somebody, you can often um, help them come to realisations they would not have normally had without your love. Because remember, a prayer for somebody is really an expression of your love for them. And uh, the expression of your love for them it causes many things to occur around them that may not have occurred if they didn't receive your love. Yep. So a prayer, for that reason, a prayer is very powerful for a person because it's an expression of your love and consideration and, and concern for their welfare. And as a result of that, it, ha it activates other laws in the universe which are all based around laws of love which then can assist the person come to a knowledge of what is wrong with them and also what the cause is and also can even assist them to become cured from the problem if uh, they take a certain course of action. Yeah. So prayer is very, very powerful. And in fact, one of the most powerful tools that you can use to um, help a person feel loved or feel love from you. We can also pray for the spirits that are with the person, that are influencing the person. Because many times these spirits have not experienced much love while they were on the earth and where they exist in the spirit world is generally in the first dimension where there isn't much love either. And when we pray for a spirit who's in one of those dimensions in the first dimension, they feel the love enter them and they wonder who's, who's now interested in them. You know, like there's this feeling of who's interested in me because they have not had many people interested in them before. And so what they do is they then uh, generally try and find out who's interested in them. When you have a feeling of love, for another person, if you're a spirit, you can see the feeling coming out of the person and aimed at the person who you have love for. It's an actual feeling that comes out of you. If you are afraid for a person, there's a different, there's a different coloured feeling that comes out of the person aimed at another person that if you're a spirit you can see with your eyes. Now when you are afraid for another person, the colour is like a grey-black and, and if the person on the other end receives your fear, their whole area where they're receiving your fear will go all grey and black. Like. 
Now, the same applies with love. If you have love for a person and it comes out of you and the person, the other person on the other end receives your love, then the colour of love uh, a lot of times is a rose kind, kind of colour. Um, sort of a, a sort of colour that's very similar to, to this colour here. A pinky rose sort of a colour. And that, that colour comes out of you and and wherever it enters the person, you see that area of their spirit body going that colour. Does that make sense? As it enters them. So, a lot of spirits are not aware of this in the first dimension because they've never experimented with how energy flows. But um, there is this flow of energy with every single feeling that you have. There is a flow, a cord, that connects you with every single person that this energy is projected at. So, if you generally hate men, <laughs> Like it doesn't really matter what man, you just generally don't like them, <laughs> then there will be this feeling coming out of you of hatred, which is a very dark um, uh, colour. I'm trying to find a colour to describe it to you. As if somebody's wearing, it's hard to find one. It's sort of like a blackish, a blackish red colour that comes out of you. And um, if the person is open to receiving your anger, that, that colour enters them and their whole body in that region where they're open to receiving your anger goes that colour. Um, so it affects them quite badly in their spirit body. So whenever you receive the anger or receive emotions from another person, it does actually physically change your body. It changes your spirit body, firstly. Uh, it affects your soul, it changes your spirit body, and it also does have an effect on your physical body as well. If it's a long-term projection of anger that you're receiving over many years, it can totally destroy you, actually. You can die from it, um, from that projection, uh, coming from another person if you're open to receiving it. And, uh, and unfortunately for many of us, we are open to receiving all sorts of emotions from spirits. And, uh, and often they notice, they don't really know how it works, most of them, but they just see, oh, that person is open for me to be angry with them and they'll accept my anger. So they, they go in, project all of their anger and rage, and the satisfaction they feel is that is somebody is receiving it. It's changing how somebody operates or acts. Yeah. Do you feel that someone hates you and Well, um, firstly, the manufacturing of love is very different from the actual feeling of love. So, we can feel that somebody hates us, but while I am open to the reception of their hatred inside of myself, it's going to be very, very difficult for me to actually feel a feeling of love towards them. To actually feel a feeling of love towards them, I would need to release the emotion first that causes me to open, be open to the projection of their hatred. Now, that emotion might be a, a feeling of guilt within yourself that you need to release, for example. When you feel guilty, other people notice your guilt, and spirits can notice your guilt, and they can project anger at you, and you'll accept their anger because you already feel guilty. And they'll project guilt based on, they'll project their anger based on what kind of guilt you have. So if you have sexual guilt, or sexual shame, for example, and they will project the, the anger, but it will be a sexual anger that they're projecting at you, something to do with you know, the genders and so forth. And if you're open to receiving that, then they will project it at you and your body will absorb it automatically. Your physical body and your spirit body will absorb it because of the soul. And that's what will occur, uh, unfortunately. So, so, how can you then love them when you're already open to feeling the feeling that they're projecting at you. Firstly, you need to work your way through the openness to feeling the feeling. So, so let's say you feel shame, then you need to feel your shame and release your shame from within you. Once you release the shame, now you have the capacity to love. Until that time, you just feel terrified about anybody triggering your shame. And, uh, and love is, you've got to always remember that love is something that has to be felt, it cannot be manufactured. It's not a thought that you can manufacture, 
I, like a lot of people I hear say in the New Age movement, they say, oh, I, just, I just send thoughts of love to them. And rather at the same time, the feeling that I feel coming from them is rage and anger and all these other feelings. And of course, very little of their thoughts of love they enter, enter the person because it's not an actual feeling of love. Right? So we've got to make sure that it's a feeling. But if we are having feelings of love for the person, yes, it definitely has an effect on the person every single time. So every single time you love the person, no matter what their condition, it doesn't matter whether they're very, very angry, upset, violent, all sorts of things, or actually in a good space where they receive your love even, you will always have an effect on them. The effect isn't always what you would classify on earth as positive, in the sense that sometimes you can love a person and it makes them more angry. Right? And the reason why is because they don't want your love and when you love, when you love them they, they get all confused and fearful and they don't know what to do about it and so they get angry instead. But, but it does change them every single time. These spirits, they can't like, be angry at each other in the spirit world, yes. they have to come to us? No, no, they can be angry at each other in the spirit world, but they have to be in the same dimension or the same location to be angry at each other. So, so it's a bit like when you're here, um, you, you, can, you can feel angry. Let's say you've got a relative on the other side of the world, and you're here. So let's say there's a relative living in Australia, and you're here in Sweden. Now, you can feel anger for that relative that's living in Australia, and if that person in Australia is open to the reception of that anger emotionally, they can actually feel it enter them, and they'll go, oh, she's angry with me again. <laughs> they'll feel that feeling enter them. However, if they're not so open, the only way you're going to be able to actually have satisfaction in terms of projecting anger at them is by going to Australia and actually being in their face and yelling and screaming at them, now you'll see the response in them that they have to your anger. Now, sometimes a lot of people have fear response to the anger. And the more afraid they become, the more angry you become <laughs> because you, there's a satisfaction you, that you get out of someone seeing, when you're angry, out of seeing someone's fear. Now, now, the same sort of thing applies in the spirit world. If the, sp the spirit might feel an emotion towards another spirit, but if they're not in the same location, it's hard to get the satisfaction from the emotion that you might otherwise get. So all they do there is they generally choose a substitute, someone who's like their mother, or like their friend, or like their cousin, or, or like their, uh, their ex-husband. And they, when they see that person, they just feel angry, and, and they do it that way. Or they go and visit the person. Now, if the person's on earth, they'll visit them quite regularly or may even visit them every single day to, to give them their anger. If the person is in the spirit world, it depends on whether they are in the same location or in a different location as to whether they can project that anger or rage. If they're in a different location, it's harder to project the anger or rage. In a dimension. In a different, yes, in a yeah, different dimension. Yeah. If they're in the same dimension, it's very easy to catch up with the person and project the anger and, and have the emotional response. So there are many spirits in the spirit world who are currently very, very upset with other spirits in the spirit world and who are yelling at them all the time and cursing them all the time. And there are some spirits in the spirit world who even go to war every single day because that's what they did when they were on earth and they just pass into the spirit world and they finish up doing the same thing for many years going to war with each other, trying to kill each other, but they can't. They all end up exhausted at the end of the day, and nobody's died, but they, <laughs> the next day they start the same process again. Right? And, uh, and so this is uh, because they are yet to work through or understand their emotions. They are yet to own their own emotions. They are yet to have a positive effect on their own emotions. They are yet to take responsibility for their own emotions, and so they're still trying to blame other people for their feelings. Can you directly see if there's, I have many injuries in my body, I've been a dance teacher, and, mm -hmm. and, but I think there's more to that. Mm -hmm. Is there a lot of spirits around me, my ancestors and so on, that are causing my pains? And if I give a more general answer, there's a lot of spirits around every single one of you in yeah, the yeah. audience at the moment. Yeah. Now, some of you have more spirits around you than others, yeah. and yes, you have quite a number around you. Yeah. And 
There are some of you who have far more spirits around you than others. Michael, you have a lot of spirits around you. You know, there, there are certain spirit people who have a lot of spirits around them, more so than others. And a lot of times that's uh, sometimes because of emotional injuries, but it's also sometimes because of common, common likes, if you like. Does that make sense? Common likes or dislikes and so forth. So it just depends on the law of attraction as to what happens. Perhaps the best way to answer most of your questions on this subject, though, is for us to proceed on the subject that I finished off with last night, because if I give you an overview of how everything works, then you start seeing how everything fits in, right? Um, it's sort of like if you know the big picture, then it's much easier to understand what's happening when I start describing individual events or, or occurrences. Yes? It's very short. Uh, is it okay to ask my over self, my higher self, to speak with somebody else's higher self? Or uh, is, it, is it not at all okay? <laughs> I can't answer you because you've just been unloving. Uh -huh, I've been unloving. Yeah. And actually, your, your unloving behaviour is motivated by spirit to interfere with where I want to take okay, today. Sure. Does that make sense? Okay. And you see, this happened a lot yesterday. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, where different persons in the audience um, displayed unloving behaviour. And I want to address that today because the whole reason why I'm here is to talk about love. And, and, and to do that, we need to understand how things happen inside of us. You see, for, for many of us, we don't realise, but we're heavily motivated by many of our questions and not actually our questions. They're actually questions of spirits with us, who prompt us. And when we feel like yelling it out and, and getting, you know, getting our desires met, that is a demand. And we're not recognising the demand, you see? So what we need to do is we need to recognise, OK, I feel this feeling that you've got to solve my issue. Now, the problem with personal questions is we have an audience, let's say, of 50 people, right? And when I'm asking a personal question, what I am actually doing is forcing those 50 people into like, being involved in my personal life and my one question. Now, now can you see that's not as loving a, a course of action than, than asking a question that is more general, that may actually affect all the people present. Does that make sense? Yeah? Michael? Yeah, for me, it doesn't make sense at all. I don't know if I misunderstand. Yep. But I, I, uh, I think it's very uh, good to ask personal questions that's coming from your heart, you can say. Yes. I, I think that creates energy. When you speak generally of, about things, I, I'm, like now I'm speaking about myself. Yep. And, uh, I'm, uh, uh, for me, it's uh, very important to be yourself. I agree. And, and don't uh, like be general, be personal, I, I think. But there is a difference. Can I say Michael. this? Yeah, please. Yeah. And uh, now, for instance. Michael, can I just stop you again? <laughs> uh, uh, There's a feeling of annoyance in you. Um, that comes again from spirits that are with you. I had your spirit friends today attacking me this morning for nearly one hour. Right? The people who are with you, the spirits with you, were attacking me for nearly one hour this morning. And, and the reason why is because they do not agree and they feel very frightened that if you listen more to what I'm saying, that you might change some of your opinions and in the process of changing some of your opinions, that they will lose a connection with you. They're very frightened of losing the connection with you. They've had a large influence in almost everything that you've been doing in your life up until this point. And they feel very connected with maintaining that. They want to maintain that connection with you. They are concerned that if I explain the full truth to you, uh, you know, give you an overview, if you like, of the truth about the universe and so forth, that this will cause you to ponder on things that you haven't perhaps pondered on before, and as a result of that, feel less of a connection with them. And they are con very concerned about that, and they've spent the, an hour, like I said this morning, so concerned about it that they're willing to attack me for the, this potential happening to yourself. And I feel it's fine for people to ask personal questions, 
But let's get the personal questions in context. You see, the problem for most, most of the time when we, when we come to a group like this is that we are so intent on asking a personal question that relates to our personal life that we're not willing to see the big picture and how every question fits into this big picture. And I feel it's very, very important, firstly, to get that groundwork if we're truly going to progress spiritually. The problem with asking a personal question like you were going to is that this personal question um, does not give us, firstly, any option of looking at the entire picture first and then asking the question in amongst that picture. So I'm not saying to people, don't ask your questions or personal questions. However, I am saying that let's first get an overview of how everything works, because once we've got the overview of how everything works, then the personal questions will have far more power. You'll have a way not only to interact with it all and understand it all, but it will affect your life then. That's what I feel. So, um, so I feel there is a big difference between actually having a selfish motivation and a motivation where everybody benefits, which is a more loving-based motivation. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Then I'd like to say something. Sure. Uh, now we have uh, in our thing 30 minutes. Yep. And uh, uh, it's loud. most of this talking is about fear and fear based things. And uh, I'm like looking around when people get like, you know, it, it, I, I have a. a is that why you created a newspaper called the Happy Newspaper? If that's the reason. Yeah. Uh, I feel. Can I? Can I speak? Sure, sure, sure. If you allow me to speak, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Uh, uh, the language is one thing. Yes, so I have to, You have to give me a chance. Yeah. Uh, uh, for me, it, 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 life works different for everybody. Uh, like for me, it's like this. Uh, that if you can feel if uh, if you speak about positive things and don't concentrate on the other, like you said yesterday, right? on the right side you speak about how it works, and the other thing is truth, uh, and their humbleness, truth and love. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I have a wish because I'm sitting here. I'm sitting uh, six five, six hours yesterday, and I think it's so much about this thing on the right-hand side. Uh, so I'm very interested for you to speak about your things, what you say in this 20 second uh, uh, level of uh, whatever. Uh, speak about this, maybe your experience of that, because I actually don't, I, I'm not like agree about this, because I trust myself I trust my feelings, and what you are saying all to this group, like you are attacked, okay? Uh, it's uh, it's a way of speaking, you know. Uh, I, uh, yeah. So and another thing I like to say here uh, about this reincarnation, because I don't know uh, when I have a chance again to speak. So I say now, well, I don't have to wait for something. Uh, I, I'm, I myself is reincarnated, and people in here I know uh, is that as well. And uh, I, I want you to uh, know that. And if you don't understand that, maybe you don't understand everything you think you understand. Uh, yeah. All right, well, let's address your two issues first. Firstly, there is the issue that you raise of whether I'm talking about fear-based things or truth. Now, I feel I'm just talking about, I'm just talking about truth. The truth is, for an hour this morning, I was attacked by the spirit friends with you. That is the truth. Now, whether you wish to hear that or not is up to you. Now, my feelings are truth always exposes. Remember I said yesterday, the principles, the basic principles that I'm teaching are this. Humility is the doorway into truth. And truth is the doorway into love. Now, when you don't want to hear that truth, you are telling me that you can't progress any further than here. Because humility is the ability to actually absorb truth. 
I'm allowed to say, this is what happened. I'm allowed to describe to other people when they ask me questions about their particular physical ailments and so forth, exactly what happened. Does that make sense? Or what is happening? Now, for me, that is truth. For you, you see that as fear. Now, that's okay that you see it differently than I. I've got no problem with that. However, I put to you that there is a general problem here in Sweden and everywhere on the earth, and that is we only want to hear the good bits. We do not want to hear the truth about the bad bits. Does that make sense? To everyone. Now, the problem is, is that many of the spirits who pass live their entire life on earth not wanting to hear about the bad bits. <coughs> that's not my case. I well, I feel it is your case. To be blunt, Michael. Well, to me, that, that's what you're hearing right now. When I describe the truth, you feel it's fear. Yeah. And I, I don't feel afraid of it. But can I say one thing? Yesterday, I asked some people, somebody you know very, very closely, yeah. one woman, and I said, it's too much on the other side. And, and she was agreed that it was uh, too much talking about the other thing. My, my language is not... Can but I my, say, but can Michael... I, can I end this? And it's like, I'm not, I'm talking about, if you talk about love and positive things, it's like you say about, you, you are talking about, you should not behave like that and that and that. I, I have a long experience myself, I can see, I see some friends here I know, I can see they like, they, they not like, they don't look like, they don't look happy, they look like they're going down. My, my role isn't to make you happy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I don't have a responsibility to make you happy. I have a responsibility to tell you the truth. And how that truth hits you is up to you. It's not just one truth, you know, it's different. You have one truth. No, I don't, have, I don't agree at all. No, I'm sorry, Michael, but I do not agree at all. You've had your chance now to speak. I, I said yesterday quite clearly that there is a thing called God's truth, and that is absolute. Absolute. In other words, there's not your version of it or my version of it. It is as it is. Now, either the spirits with you attacked me this morning or they did not. One of those statements is true. They either did or they did not. So that is your experience. No. <laughs> it either happened or it did not happen. Yeah, you, it, of course it happened because you have experienced your attack or some spirits. No, it, it might be my misinterpretation of that and it might be something else. Does that make sense? What I'm saying is, there is an absolute truth, then there is your opinion of it and my opinion of it, and both of us have to let go of our opinions of absolute truth and we have to start accepting the absolute truth, whatever that is. Now, what I'm saying to you, Michael, is that, is that your interpretation of my statements of truth, which are actually truth, you interpret as fear. This happened to me the first time I was on Earth, it happens now, every single time I speak, where a group of people believe that I'm talking about fear-based things when I'm just telling the truth. Yesterday I raised the issue that there is a place in the hell called the hells. Some of the spirits with you are in that place. That's the reality. And they do not want to accept that. And they do not want to, you to even know that. That's the reality. And I want... Sorry? No, no, not for me. Yeah. From God's perspective, that is the reality. You can believe that or not, it's up to you. And I know you don't, and that's fine. But I am going to state that truth. I am here delivering a free discussion for you to listen to. You can either choose to listen to it, or you can choose to leave. Either one's fine. It doesn't matter to me, but I am going to stay, state the truth in the discussion. And this is the thing that is very important that everybody understands, is that I am not going to shy away from the truth about any subject. The truth about reincarnation, how many of you believe you're reincarnated right now? Be honest. Right, how many? One, two, three, four. Five. No, no, we don't. Now, how many believe, up until we spoke yesterday, how many of you believe for certain that you're reincarnated? Can you be? It's okay to be honest. Right? So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven or eight of the audience, yes? You obviously have very strong reasons for believing that. Right? And I, I acknowledge that you have strong reasons. However, the reasons may not be what you think they are. 
and this is something that I'm presenting to you. I stated the truth yesterday that none of those persons with their hand up have been reincarnated and there are things that you can understand about that if you wish to or you can deny that completely and go away thinking, well, yeah, I didn't learn anything here and that's fine by me too. That's why I give free discussions so that you can leave any time you want and not feel bound by paying something up front to actually sit and listen. You don't have to be here and listen. However, I put to you this. There's a reason why you're here. Somebody motivated you to be here. Something motivated you to be here. And perhaps that something or somebody who motivated you to be here wanted you to know something that you currently don't know, but that you think you do. That, that's also a potential reality, right? The key is to be open to that. Now, I can present a very logical discussion as to why nobody is reincarnated. A very logical presentation. If you're willing to listen to the whole lot of it. However, what I'm feeling from many of your spirit friends is they do not want you to listen to the whole lot of it. And the reason why is because it stops their control over you. Now, I am going to state quite clearly to you you, many of you are being controlled by spirits. You are. It's a reality, actually. And if you can actually see spirits, you will see the different spirits above each person and their controls. You can even see them feeding sometimes the very questions that you're asking. The very question that you're asking that you think is from yourself often is from another. Right? It's being triggered through a flow of energy, a flow of thoughts from other people around you. And what I am willing to do is to tell you the truth about that. There are very few people on the planet that are willing to tell you the truth about that. The reason why is because everyone has emotional investments in making everybody else happy. I don't have an emotional investment in making you happy. I want you to know the truth. The truth will set you free then you'll be truly happy. I don't have to make you happy. The truth itself will have the effect of creating your own happiness. That's the truth. If we grow. Yeah. Uh, I'm willing to listen to this. Mm -hmm. And uh, recognition. Uh, to be like this, why I thought I was, it was because I knew things that I... That you didn't learn. Yes. You, learned, you knew things you didn't learn. This, uh, experience in my family. Yes. That's why I thought. And from a very young age. For you, yes. it's younger than five years of age, yes? Yeah. I, yes. I, I, I know things that no one can explain. Yep. Uh, so that's why I thought it was. What could that be? If, well, if you explain that, maybe because I'm, I'm buying some other things. I, I agree. This is the thing is that, you see, if we understand the full truth of what's going on, it should answer every question satisfactorily and logically. That's the beauty of truth. The truth has the effect of answering questions right across the board in every case. Falsehood does not have that effect. Falsehood has the effect of not being able to answer certain questions. And therefore, we need to get more truth. And once we get more truth, we can answer every question possible. That's the reality. There is an answer to your question. Right? But we need to understand the process of what actually happens, and then we can start addressing the issue of what doesn't happen. <laughs> Does that make sense to everyone? So, so, you see, on the earth, as I said at the beginning of the discussion yesterday, on the earth, there is this higher desire for most of us to absorb things that are spiritually, spiritually speaking, that appeal to us emotionally. We like what we hear and so we save it and keep it with us. That's how 1.5 billion people on the planet believe in Christianity when many of you don't. That's also how another 1.5 billion people on the planet believe in the Muslim faith and you, many of you don't. How it happens is by having an emotional openness to a certain type of belief that you are then unwilling to challenge that you're unwilling to actually work your way through and challenge. And what I'm suggesting is that it's far better to actually challenge every belief in every way possible. And when we challenge beliefs, we end up with what can only be truth. 
This is how the scientific community works every single day. They challenge different things through experimentation, and in the end they arrive at a particular truth that they know for certain. This is how we have power here right now, because somebody 150, 200 years ago did that. Right? And then somebody worked out about what's called alternating power, and Tesla did that. And he did that in the 19, early, late 1800s. And now we have alternating power that can be transmitted over long distances. Now, all of that happened because somebody was willing to actually absorb a new truth that they didn't know before. And what I'm saying to you is that what I'm speaking to you about is the truth. Now, you don't have to agree with me. I'm not asking you to agree with me. The whole... I make free presentations so that you don't even have to agree with me and you can come in and, and you can do whatever you like generally as long as you're loving in the presentation and leave and you don't have to agree with the single word I said. Right? And there's no skin off your nose, as the saying goes, <laughs> for doing so. You, you don't, aside from the loss of your time, that's the only thing that you've lost. Right? For myself, um, I feel that that is a a very worthy cause. That's my personal opinion. Because, because we, we're given the free will to make these decisions through this, through this process. What I'm saying to you is I know for certain the truth about the entire spirit world as it's currently known through my personal experience. Now you might think that's arrogant, but it, it is arrogant if it's not true. Do you understand? So if I'm saying to you, look, I've had this personal experience of this entire spirit world that I want to describe to you, and I am not truthful with you, I'm telling you a lie, then that is arrogant as well, isn't it? Because I'm saying something that never really happened. Yes? I'm lying to you and I'd be arrogant. But there is the potential that what I'm saying to you is actually true. That I have actually had that personal experience and remember it and can describe it to you in detail if you wish to hear it. Right? That is also a potential truth that is up to you <laughs> to investigate. Does that make sense? If you wish to. You, know, you don't have to. You, if it's only if you wish to. Now, in that experience, we can uh, answer many of your questions, if not all of them. Okay? However, to do so, we have to be open to understanding the basics of that truth. Yeah? Well, um, again, we can answer that question if we go to the basics of the entire conversation. We can actually answer that question. Um, when you say, are there souls that have, been ha that have had a consciousness of their own existence longer than others? Yes, there certainly are. But there is no old soul on the earth. They are all young souls. The first time that they've incarnated on the earth. Does that make sense? With the exception of a few who have returned to teach, thing, to teach the truth. But, but generally, every single person on the earth is a young soul. This is their first incarnation. And this can be described in detail as to why it feels like some are old when some are young. <coughs> Does that make sense? Now, just because something feels to be a certain thing, it doesn't mean it actually is. There could be other things going on and we need to know everything that can go on, and then we can understand what's happening. So there is a certain feeling that people get that that person there, even though they're five years old, like if you imagine Corolla's mother or father, listening to this five-year-old say all these amazing things that they've never ever heard before, now of course they'd be going, there's something very strange going on around here, yes? And then they'd want to know what that is if they really wanted to have some kind of investigation of the phenomena, they would want to know why. There is an explanation for that. But, we can also then assume that Corolla has been around 50 lifetimes on Earth and make this assumption without there being very much evidence at all. We can make that assumption. And then we can go down a totally different track with that. That, is, that could be false. So we need to investigate why and listen to the potential answers. 
The problem that we have is that generally emotionally we only accept the emotions that emotionally we want to accept. So if I want to hear that I've been here 50 times, then I'll love that thought that I'm here 50 times. If I don't want to hear that I've been here 50 times because I can't remember any of them, then, then I'll want to not hear that I've been here, been here 50 times because to me the whole thing's confusing. And it's only my emotion that causes me to accept one so-called truth, which is not really a truth because it's unproven, over the other. And what I'm suggesting that is we need to only accept truths that can be proven, that have actual real answers that can be established. That's my suggestion. Any acceptance of any other thing that claims to be truth is just going to lead us on a wild goose chase, as we say in Australia. I don't know what you say here, when something goes along a direction that you don't want it to go for many years, and then you realise at the end that it all turn, didn't turn out the way you expected. What do you call that here in Sweden? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have a Swedish sort of slogan for that or a saying for that, yes? And, and what, what I would like to encourage you to do in this discussion, and the one we have on next Saturday, is to allow yourself to investigate all of the possible answers with regard to reincarnation instead of just the one you would like to accept. Does that make sense? Now, if you just accept the one you would like to accept, there's little point in sitting in the audience from this point. Do you understand? Because if you just like to accept one explanation of reincarnation without, it, without looking at the potential of the other truths that are available to you, then, then you're very, very close to new truth, which means you are not humble. And that's okay, you're allowed to choose to be not humble, but it's pointless wasting another 12 hours of your time, or, or, or 8 hours of your time, or however long I speak, with just sitting there disagreeing. If you are open to hearing, that's a different matter altogether. Do you, do you understand? Mm -hmm. And that's what I, that's the approach I take with every single audience that I speak to. Exactly the same approach. I am not saying to you that there will not be things that I say that will challenge you. They, things will challenge you, for sure. And I'm not saying to you that some of the things will challenge you so much that you may walk away in total fear because you're afraid of that particular thing that you feel challenged upon. I don't see that as my fault or my cause. All I wish to do is tell you the truth. I don't feel afraid of the truth. And all I wish to do is share the truth with you. And I encourage you not to feel afraid of the truth either. But rather, allow yourself to feel any feeling that you have in, in, and if fear is one of those feelings, feel it, but don't condemn it until you've felt through every single emotion. Yeah? Does that make sense? So let's start on that. Yesterday I began, uh, later in the afternoon, I began by explaining the process of incarnation and reincarnation. Yep. So what I would like to do is describe that process properly, in more detail, and then answer your specific questions related to reincarnation. Because every single question should be able to be answered. You, you agree? So let's pro approach it this way. There is a God. Which is an entity that has masculine and feminine qualities. That God had children, billions, billions and billions of them, which are all souls, and these souls in this state, when they were first created, had no personal experience, they had no concept of self. No self-awareness. No um, self-identity. 
in the sense that they were not aware of their own identity. Is there any questions we would like to ask about that part of the creation? All right. How, how, how did we become? You said God in, into existence. Yes, you said God. God or had children? How? Uh, God created us. Created. Yeah, created our souls. <coughs> so it was a creation. You could also, if you wish to call it, God's procreation, couldn't you? In I a don't way. know what that means. Procreation in a, in a English means uh, the act of um, the love-making act causing conception okay. and therefore creation through the process, yes? Procreation. And the souls were created by God in that manner. Basically, God <coughs> created these souls in a sexual union, created these souls, and these souls all came into existence, most probably all at the same time. Now, I say most probably because... Every single person who is involved in that creation isn't self-aware. So all we can actually do is make certain suppositions at that point. Because nobody in the universe has ever discovered actually the point of creation of their own soul. Now in the future we may, but at this point no one actually has. Adam and Eva. Adam and Eve? Yep. Well, they were just one of the souls that uh, were created here. In the spirit world, their names are now... Uh, Amon and Aman. Uh, that's their names. I've spoken to them. So I understand what they understood in terms of what their personal description is. They do not remember being created, just the same as I don't, and just the same as you will not, even when you pass over into the spirit world. Yeah? There, this is the male I am and female I am, yes, that's what their names are, and uh, they, their first recollection, their very first recollection, was being in a full grown body, yes, for the very first time, and being aware for the very first time from that moment. They can't remember anything before that time. They can't remember a parent. They can't remember any other thing. Does that make sense? I'm only describing you what they remember. Right? We can make suppositions about it, but nobody knows the truth about it because nobody's been told the truth about it from God because God was the person who was there before they were self-aware. Yes? When a man and a woman uh, are having sex, it means that it's very holy, the process, because it's coming a soul into a birth. So it must be uh, uh, people that are, you know, playboys, playmates, just playing around with that. So, I mean, what's the effect on their soul? It is quite a large effect on their soul. When you meet them in the spirit world after they've been like that on earth, you find you only find them in the hills. They sometimes progress, and many of them have progressed beyond that point. But initially, when they pass over, they pass into the hells of the spirit world. And one of the reasons why is because they have not learnt about morality, about the holiness of the sexual union. Do you understand? And certainly, they arrive in the darkness of the spirit world, and they often take many years, if not sometimes thousands of years, to get out of that place because of the choices that they've made. But let's continue with our discussion. Everyone's okay? Yes? I have a question about the relationship with the... Uh, that is, like, our true mother and father, God is, yes. So, so we have a, a mother and father-like relationship from the beginning with God? Yes. Very important point. It's, it's the most important point you can ever think of when you think about it. Our true mother and father is God, not our mother and father on earth. So how, how come it is so difficult to get that freedom towards God? Because of the disconnection that mankind has had over a long period of time, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, from God. 
and we'll talk about how that disconnection began. The persons who began the disconnection were actually Amon and Amman. Amon and Amman, the reason why I talked to them in the spirit world when I first wanted to talk with them is because I wanted to find out why they left God. They actually chose to leave God. Uh, it was a, f a firm decision they made about self-reliance, and we'll talk about that. But they actually chose to leave God. They chose to be self-reliant. And in that process of just choosing self-reliance, they, they burdened their procreation, their own children, with the same burden of desiring self-reliance. So self-reliance is, a, is a, a war against um, feeling the love of the truth of the um, Spot on. It's a very important thing so to understand. So how do you get, get away from it? Well, is it? Yes. One of the biggest... If you are, if you are taught that uh, here on earth, every single moment. Every single moment, yeah. The biggest single injury that the planet has is the injury of self-reliance. Oh, this is getting heavy. <laughs> That's the biggest single emotional injury. Why, why is it heavy? It's, 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 it's heavy good burden. to know, isn't it? Yes, but it's a heavy burden. Well, what's the opposite of self-reliance? God, God trusts. Trust. God reliance? God reliance. Uh, I don't know about you, but I would rather rely on God than myself. <laughs> and to me, relying on the Creator is good news, not bad news. <laughs> You understand? Like to me, that makes me happy that I can rely on God. Yes. That for many of us, for many of us, that should we should look at self-reliance and we should go, why would I like that? <laughs> and to be frank, how many of us really like it? It's browbeaten into you from infancy, but how many of you really like it? But most of us don't even really like it because this is the way God created us to be. God reliant. Yes. It's a very important point to raise. All of God's children are God's children, not our children. So even our own child is not our child. It is God's child. Right? And imagine if everyone on the planet knew that, how would we treat that child? Instead of treating our child with ownership, we'd treat it with respect, love, compassion, understanding, but we wouldn't try to own the child, would we? We wouldn't try to control the child because we'd respect that somebody else is the parent. So you could think as God, as the parent, and not only think of it, it is reality. God is your parent. God is the parent of your soul. Remember, you are one half of the soul. So God is a parent of both halves of your soul. The complete soul itself, yes? Yeah. Where is the snake? Where is what snake? <laughs> there was no snake. <laughs> they had apples, but the apples wasn't the problem. Um, they used to eat apples, of course, but uh, apples were not the problem. We'll describe what happened. That's Christianity. Sorry? That's Christianity. That's Christianity. And a lot of Christianity and other faiths as well, and not just Christianity, actually portray the single origin of the human race. And they also portray some kind of uh, what, they, what they call uh, rebellion from God. These things are basic truths that have been modified so much by some holy books that they've become unrecognisable in terms of what actually happened. If you ask a mon and a man what actually happened, you will find the actual events which are very, very different to what the Bible describes. However, the Bible does describe it in symbology. So, so sim symbolically, what happened or what is described in the Bible did actually happen. But we've described the relationship between the symbology and the actual event. Does that make sense? Yeah. There was someone else? Yeah. Uh, going back to the situation of a baby, uh, what happened with a woman that made the choice to have a child and she doesn't care if she has a father? the baby has a father or not, just for her own yeah. gratification. Exactly. Yes. What is going to happen with the soul of the person? Well, if the woman realises her mistake and goes through a process of realising that the only reason really why she's having the child is because of her own fear, and she works her way through that emotionally, 
it could be that the child, nothing happens to the child, that the child grows up very secure and safe and, and very balanced. But if the woman chooses to hold on to the child as if it's a possession or a, a, in ownership or something like that, then of course the child will grow up with many severe emotional problems and uh, then will have to work their way through such emotional problems that the mother has created in the child. However, remember, God is the real parent. So, so if the mother has the thought, no, I am not the real parent, all I am is the creator of the body for this soul. That's all I am. The creator of both bodies, remember? The spirit body and the material body. All we are is the creator of that body for the soul to live in or live with. But it's not the responsibility of the woman to really care that the child get a, a good father. And just make the choice, okay, I don't want a son and that's it. I don't care if the man is there or not. Well, on earth we are very addicted to motherhood and fatherhood. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, a, it's a big problem. Because many of us then have a sense of ownership over our child as a result of this addiction. If we bring a child into the world, we will not be worried about who's its father or who's its mother. We will just be worried about, because we know God's its father and mother, so we would be more worried about whether the child receives love and attention from both genders on the earth. And it won't matter whether it's an uncle, an aunt, or a, a grandfather, or whatever, and that takes that role of receiving some, of that the child receives some love from that male person. And we, it won't matter to us. It won't even matter if we give the child up for adoption and we understand that the child would be better off in somebody else's hands who can give them love. That we would have less stigma about that on the planet if we had this feeling that the child is not our child, but rather is God's soul, half of one, that has incarnated. So what about abortion? At the moment of conception, the soul is now attached to the body. As soon as you choose to abort a child, you are cutting off its life from the attachment to that body. So there is obviously some negative consequences of that. Certainly, on the child as well as on the mother or father. What happens? What happens is the child immediately has become individualised, and we'll describe this in the process of individualisation, the child has become individualized, but when we cut off its bodies, when we stop its bodies from existing, now the little soul with the spirit body arrives in the spirit world, and there is a person generally in the spirit world assigned to nurse this child until it grows and can be self-sufficient. Yes? And this person is a person who's very, very loving, who's assigned to the child, and sometimes it's, a, it's more than one person, um, and sometimes there are more than one child for one person. It just depends on how many arrive at the same time in the spirit world. Unfortunately, with the amount of abortions that go on on the planet, there are nearly 50 million to 100 million abortions, uh, or even more, every single year. So that means there are more than 100 million little children arriving in the spirit world that need to be nursed by different parents. Now, obviously, that creates a large workload for different people in the spirit world. What happens with the, the spontaneous abortion? The same thing, it's a, but it's a little different in that with a real abortion, either the mother or the father or both did not want the child. Whereas with a miscarriage, and obviously there are emotions involved in the mother or the father that cause the miscarriage, but, but the actual miscarriage uh, usually retains some love between the mother and the father and the child. So the mother and father on earth and the child in the spirit world. In the case of an abortion, often the child feels very isolated and unwanted for a period of time and, uh, and the nurses of the child give it the love that the parents could not supply, the parents on earth could not supply. Does that make sense? If we go through the process of the incarnation process, we'll understand more of what happens there. So it's always about understanding, uh, you know, we can involve these, a lot of these questions in the process that we describe. So we all understand that these are God's children, of which you are one half. Right? You are one half of one of these. Not, not the whole thing. One half. Okay. One half of the soul incarnates first, and then the other half follows soon after. When I say soon after, 
it can be a period of up to 25, 30 years between the two halves incarnated. However, it's highly unlikely because of the amount of desire the soul has to reunite. So often the halves arrive on earth within five years of each other, less often 10 years, and even more or less often 20 years apart or so forth. Now, the two halves split, they split, but when, you, when I say split, it's probably not the right word, because they still have a force or energy connection between each other. Does that make sense? So, so they just envelop different bodies, but they still are energetically and emotionally connected to each other. Yes? So what happens is, the first half of the soul, let's say, it's usually the most... Um, it, it might not be the male who incarnates first, by the way, it may be the female who incarnates first. And, and bear in mind, I want to draw up what happens with homosexuality as well, because it's very important to understand. Um, but I'm just drawing like 80, around 80 percent, or more, just over 80 percent of the cases. This is what happens. Uh, generally, there's a split that's a masculine and feminine split like this. Now, what happens there is that let's say this half incarnated first, and it incarnates because of the desire of the parents to have sex. So the parents have sex, and the personality. By the way, I must point out, it has personality. Here. God designed individual personality in each soul. Right? This is why two parents can have three children and they're very different from each other. And the reason why is because each one has an individual personality that's built into the soul that God designed. Yes? So they have personality but they are not conscious of their own personality before they arrive. They have to experience life in order to be conscious of the personality. Yes? That makes sense? Yeah? So yet, uh, often they have similar personality because the parents attract the children with their... Uh, um, you mean similar personality to the parents? Um, or a similar personality to each other on the other half? They have, I think they can have similar personality to what attracted them to the parents. Or basically the parents attract them, but... The parents attract them, yeah. and the parents attract them through their emotional state at the time of conception. Mm -hmm. So at the time of conception, let's say, let's say um, myself and Mary decided to have a child, and at the time of conception, I had homophobia, a feeling of homophobia, and Mary did too. It's highly likely that we will uh, attract uh, what you would classify as a homosexual soul, right? To to actually help us work through our homophobic issues. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So so the parents' emotions, which is a combination of their damaged emotions and their pure emotions, attract this little personality into their life, and the little personality, the soul is connected to, the way it actually is constructed is it envelops the two bodies. So the spirit body and the material body are like that, basically on top of each other. And the soul itself, the heart of the soul, envelops it. The soul controls the energy systems of both bodies. Does that make sense? So all this chakra stuff that you've heard of, that's all controlled by the soul. And it, and it displays itself in the spirit body. Yes? It's a bit of an aside. But... So, I'll draw it next to each other so that you can see the difference. So we have a spirit body created at the time of conception and a physical body created at the time of conception. You said material body, was that a physical body? That's a physical body and spirit body. But you said uh, material body as now. What that same is? thing. The yeah. same thing, okay. Material, I use the words material body or physical body interchangeably. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So how it looks is you've got the soul encompassing the body that it, that it connects to. That might be the spirit body. And then over the top of that, and in fact it is completely layered, and the spirit body is a little larger initially, than the physical form, 
but not very much larger. It has an energy field of its own, which can be actually measured. Right? People can measure it on Earth if they decided to. They can measure the energy of the spirit body in comparison to the physical body. They can also measure the soul and its weight. Right? But there are, are different things that we need to talk about. <coughs> so, female side at some point incarnates. Same concept, conception process. The two bodies are created, the physical, the spiritual body and the physical body. <coughs> Like so. Okay. They're now on Earth, inside Mum's tummy, of course, having an experience. So, for the moment of conception, the soul is having an experience. It's absorbing information, it's absorbing experience from the world that it's now incarnated into. Uh, do they have the same, the, the male and the female power? Do they have the same ability to absorb uh, or exactly the same way? Uh, conditions to absorb uh, their mother father energy um, in the same way? Are they are they the, the same? Are they very like these parts? Are these the two same? halves alike? Yes. Well, obviously. And do they absorb in the same way? Um, getting the same like injuries or whatever? Obviously not, because the parents have different injuries. So we, we can talk about how they absorb emotions and experience. But basically, in answer to your question, if you can think about it, here we have now probably one family. So we have the mum and the dad. Yes? Whoops. <laughs> uh, the dad might wear a dress, but I probably won't. And then on this side, we have a mum and a dad, and so forth, yes? Now obviously, the two halves of the soul, because they were constructed by God as a unified item, if you like, a unified condition, they obviously have very, very similar personality characteristics and traits. Does that make sense? Because they are half of each other. They are the other half of themselves. So they have very, very similar personality and traits. However, after their incarnation begins, so remember this is the first incarnation, so after this first incarnation begins, they are now absorbing their environment. And they are like little sponges. Like they absorb everything. They absorb every good thing and every bad thing. They absorb everything. And that's the problem, is that if there's anything that's negative or unloving in the parents, well, that gets absorbed as well. If there's anything that's good and loving in the parents, that gets absorbed as well. So, as they grow, you can see their personality develops, but not always in harmony with their original personality, because the emotions of their family affect the personality to a large degree. It affects their fears and their longings and their desires and what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do and so forth. Yeah. So can you see um, the responsibility of the parents? If we're truly being responsible parents, we would let the child develop emotionally, freely, as long as we teach them the issues of humility, love and truth. Right. If we allow, that would give them complete freedom to develop exactly as their personality is. But unfortunately, that's not what happens most of the time. What happens is these parents have emotional injuries of their own. They have desires for the child. I might be a man and I might want the child to become an ice hockey player. <laughs> and my son is born, and from the time he's born, I'm teaching him how to become an ice hockey player. Can you see I'm moulding him into something that, might, that he might not be attracted to in naturally through his own soul, but I'm pushing him in a certain direction along a certain train of thought and a certain... Now, of course, that's going to have an effect on him. He's going to grow up either not doing that or doing it, and if he's not doing it, he'll feel like he's disappointed his father. If he does it, he'll, feel, he'll be looking for his father's approval all the time. It's going to have an effect on him. 
uh, this is in a normal relation when the parents, uh, with the, I mean, when the mother takes care of the child until a certain age, because when you see that children are going very small already to the kindergarten, mm -hmm. it means that you, they are taken care by somebody with many emotional injuries. Well, and just, you, just often just the same amount of emotional injuries as the mum. But, <laughs> but let's now... You don't know now, to, to reflect it because you don't know who is taking care of them. Of course. So now we have an extended family <laughs> that is now affecting, which, is, which I call the environment, which is now affecting the development of this little soul. And the extended family is not only your relatives, so it's not only relatives, but it's the friends that might come into your home, and their school teachers, their child caregivers, and so forth. These are all now having an effect on the development of this little soul. Now, if those people don't recognise that this is God's little soul, and those people don't recognise that it's God's little soul, and those people don't recognise that it's God's little soul, can you see that now we've got lots and lots of emotional things being bombarded at this little child? Uh, can you understand why the little child's crying for the first few year, years of its life? Because it's receiving a lot of emotions that it doesn't need to receive. There is no need for a child to actually cry at all. But, it, but of course they do because of all this bombardment of emotions. Yes? Any other questions? Far away. Yeah, I was thinking about the, the, the crying from being separated from the real parent, the real parent. Well, because these, these souls were not conscious of themselves, they're not actually conscious of the separation. God designed that because if, if they were conscious of the separation, it would be very painful. So God designed it that they were not conscious of the separation, and so therefore it's not a pain that they carry into this life. However, mothers and fathers have often had relationships, which they were then separated from, and they have a large amount of grief in them about that. So now this little child absorbs the grief of separation from the experience of the parents. So they often feel that grief of separation from something. Yeah. Now, there is a spark in this little child of natural love that can develop or be suppressed. Remember we talked about natural love yesterday? The love that comes from within you. This little child has a spark of natural love that can be developed or suppressed. But there is also a spark of the consciousness that there is something outside of itself its real parent that it can connect to. And there is a desire for it to connect to from a very young age. And in fact, while the child is in the womb, if the mother receives divine love, the mother can actually ask for divine love to enter the child as well. And therefore, the, there is an establishment, if no mother does that, there is an establishment between the child and its true parent through the reception of that love. So it's a very beautiful <coughs> gift that a mother and a father can give their child by asking for the child to receive love while it's in the womb before it's even born. Sorry, just one question, Mark. <laughs> Ask uh, away. If a child is quite small and yep. not even a year old and it's already going to a kindergarten, this kind of child are going to develop much fear, obviously, because there are many children and, and, and you know, they don't know who to take care of them. The fear is not necessarily safe. Not necessarily, because okay. like this mother might have huge amounts of fear. Mm -hmm. So whenever the child is away from the mother, it might actually feel relieved. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so so, and, and let's say because they go to childcare, the person who gives childcare might have not much fear at all. And so whenever the child is with the childcare giver, they go, oh, relax now. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy now. And then when they go home to mum, they cry because of the fear that, that mum has. So it depends on the emotions 
of each individual as to what will affect the child in its development, <coughs> positive or negative. Yes. So, so the reality is this mother might have had an emotion, I want this child to prove that I'm a woman. No? Many women have this emotion, that until you have a child, you're not really a woman. Have you noticed that? That some people seem to have that feeling? This is why a lot of young women get pregnant at the age of 13, 12, 13. This is why a lot of young women develop sexually before, in, at younger ages now. <coughs> They used to develop sexually at 16, 17. Now it's like even pre-teens sometimes now. Right? The reason why is because there's this terrible emotional projection upon girls that they're not really a woman until they have a child. So the body even starts developing earlier and earlier and earlier right? because it needs to accept this emotional projection to be approved of. Right? If the, if the mother and father have certain emotional issues and injuries, then these will greatly affect this development of this child. And sometimes it's a relief for this child to get away from its mum and dad. And that's why sometimes the child seems to behave really, really nice when they're at kindergarten <laughs> or in childcare, child care, but when they go home to mum and dad, it's totally different. Because there are different emotions in play, you see. Okay. So now we've got, now in a modern society we have this extended family affecting the development of this little child. Remember this little child is God's child. It's really all of our brother and sister. Because back here, we were all here at one point. So we were all brothers and sisters. God's children. Right. So even if I had give birth to a son, which I have two of my own, right? When I give birth to a son, and, and my wife gives birth to a son, that, that giving birth to a son is not my son. He's my brother. Right? If I remember he's my brother, I will treat him very differently than if I treat him as if he's my son. You know, if I treat him as my brother, then I treat him with some more respect and more love and concern generally. And often I treat him as if I do not own him. Unfortunately, there are a lot of ownership emotions in child rearing nowadays, and that causes major damage to the child. So I have two sons, one's 28 years old and one's 26 years old, and uh, when we're together, everyone feels that we're brothers. Uh, and, that, and I feel like I'm my brothers. That's the reality. Okay. Any questions? Tell me what it's okay to ask about the twin flame thing. <laughs> and well, these two are twin flames. These two here. Yeah. This half of the soul and this half of the soul are what in New Age circles are referred to as twin flames. Yeah. I call that soulmates. Okay. True soulmates. They are half of each other. Yeah. Yep. This other concept came along in New Age circles called soulmates, which is almost like it. And half a dozen people can be your soulmates, mm -hmm. and I don't agree with that. Right? Mm -hmm. There is only one soulmate, and that is the other half of yourself, like a twin flame arrangement. Is that it is... possible to meet your twin flame? Oh, Always whatever possible. You call it now. God, God designed you to meet him or her. Yeah. God, God designed the process. This whole process, part of this entire process, which is called the individualization of the soul, where the soul becomes self-aware, individualization, oh, is it S or Z, it uh, depends on what you like, uh, <laughs> of the soul. Yeah. The individualization of the soul is a process that involves both halves. Eventually both halves will reunite, that is God's plan, all the time. You will reunite at some point in your future with the other half of your soul. Does that make sense? It will happen, for certain. It just depends on how you engage the process as to how fast it happens. You are all capable of meeting them by the time you're 10 years of age, or even younger. Right? Unfortunately on the earth, that rarely happens, because of the different emotional injuries and other factors which we'll describe as we go along. There is only one person that is that person. 
This is why many young children believe there is only one for them. Have you noticed that? Many young children believe that. It's only when they grow that they start thinking differently. Uh, what happened with twins? Are twins? Uh, twins are separate souls. So they, but the reason why they are very close is because they've been in the same womb at the same time. And though, so therefore, they are experiencing the same modification effects at the same moment. And for that reason, they are often very, very similar in terms of their experience. So our uh, daughter from the first century, in this life, has reincarnated, and she is a twin. And, and her twin is very, very different from her, because she's had 2,000 years of experience when her twins only had her first incarnation. So it's very, very different. But for the majority of people who are twins, it's the first incarnation, and so they're going through exactly the same experience at exactly the same time, even though they're different personalities. And this is why the parents often can tell immediately who they're talking to, because they, don't, they can feel the difference between the two souls. But other people look at them and go, which one are you again? <laughs> Particularly if they're identical twins. Which one are you again? I can't, you know, you look the same as the other. And... Uh, yeah, I have known quite a number of twins through my life, obviously, in 2000 years. But even in this life, I've known a number of twins too. And you can very easily feel the difference between the two halves. The, the, two, the two separate halves. But they are not halves of the same soul. They are incarnating. The way God's designed it is that to incarnate into one parent, it's very rare for two souls to incarnate through one single parent. And there's a lot of reasons why that's the case, uh, which we can talk about later. How do you know when you need, or if you need to other one? Well, a lot of people think that they know straight away. But the reality is, it's very, very hard to know while you hold on to lots of different emotional patternings from your parents. And so, what actually happens on the earth now is that a lot of soulmates walk past each other in the street without even recognising each other at all. Right? Because of how suppressed they've become emotionally towards each other due to their emotional patternings of their environment. Yeah. And so you can't guarantee that you're going to be able to go initially by your feeling that another person, that's my soulmate. You can't guarantee that that's the case. Because there, there will be emotions inside of you that you need to feel before you will know for certain. Any intergender emotional injury that you carry will affect your ability to recognise your soulmate. So in other words, if I have an emotional injury as a male towards being a male, then that's going to affect me recognising my soulmate. And if I have an emotional injury inside of myself with regard to the female, that is also going to affect me recognising my soulmate. But if I release those injuries from myself, then as soon as my soulmate comes into my life, I'll know and feel that my soulmate has arrived. You can attract your soulmate into your life. Yeah? It's really through following those three basic principles, isn't it? That we Humility, truth and love. It's the secret to it. Humble to change, if we are committed to truth, that will naturally draw our soulmate to us, that's the process that God designed. Yeah. yeah. This is why yesterday's discussion is so important, because those three things become essential in everything. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Everything, every single thing you can do in your life, mm -hmm. those three things are essential. So this process of individualization of the soul begins the moment of conception. Right? And from then on, the soul, the little soul, is experiencing the world around it in an aware state. Now its awareness grows over time. So initially when it's conceived, when it's just the, just the first few cells dividing, then, and, or, then at that point in time it's less aware than as time goes, it becomes more developed and therefore more intellectually developed and so forth, it becomes more and more self-aware. And by the time it's born it's already quite self-aware and the self-awareness continues to grow and usually is almost complete by the age of seven years of age. Yeah? The self-awareness 
is almost complete by that stage. When I say the self-awareness, I mean the experience of its development as a, as a half, not its awareness of the other half. Right? Yeah. Uh, we're talking about souls, but uh, we tend to fall in love many times. Why? You fall in love many times. Why? Good why? question. The reason why is because we have many emotional patternings from our environment that affect what we're attracted to. And these attractions are often very different from the attraction to our soul mate. And as a result of these emotional injuries that we carry, we then feel attracted to, pe to people who have a certain type of emotional injuries that match our emotional injuries. In other words, we are in sympathetic codependency. Does that make sense? And when there is an extreme amount of sympathetic codependency, Usually we feel that as lust and love. Right? That's not the same as a soulmate relationship. Once you release these emotions that create sympathetic codependencies, then you'll be left with the pure self. And the pure self is only attracted to one person, the other half of itself. In other words, you can then live a life where you're totally alone, completely happy, until you meet the other half of yourself. And you do not feel attracted to any other person. It doesn't matter how beautiful he or she looks, you cannot be attracted to another person when you're in that state. When I say cannot, I don't mean that you must not. I mean it's physically impossible to be. <laughs> Does that make sense? when you're in a clear state. So, if you find yourself in your life falling in love with many persons or thinking that many people are your soulmates, then you're still yet to release the emotional codependencies within yourself that cause you to believe such things. When I have been in love, though, in the past, and I realised they're not my soulmates, it's felt really good. Like, you felt of course. the world. And... All of your addictions are getting rid, <laughs> or a fair number of them are. And this is why it feels so good. You see, many of us grow up, by the time we're, you know, in our teenage years, we now have many addictions already in play. And these addictions determine who we're attracted to. It, and of course, when we get our addictions met, most of us feel really happy and good. And that's why the majority of us go, oh, they're beautiful, they're lovely, and we spend six months with them, and they're a maniac, I don't like them anymore. <laughs> you know, and, and because we go through this change with the addictions and we realise that actually our addictions have brought us together and not true soulmate love that has brought us together. Is there any part of it though that, that you do open up in some ways and like, is there any beautiful part to it? <laughs> of course whenever you fall in love there is a beautiful part to it. However, on the planet most people who fall in love don't fall in love, they fall into addiction. If they fell into love, they'd never fall out of it. Yeah. Right? The, the reality is, you, you, if you really love somebody, even if they're not your soulmate, you, you will continue to love them after the relationship is broken up. Mm -hmm. Now, for most people, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. For most people, what happens is you break up, and there's, now you're angry, bitter with them, and upset with them. <laughs> and, uh, and that's an indication that the original attraction was not... Yeah. based on love. Just because sometimes I look back, and I still can love that person, and I'm like, oh, that was a beautiful feeling. Um, yeah, but see, it's a beautiful <laughs> feeling because of the many addictions that we have, you see. And this is where, when you um, are only attracted to your soulmate, you recognise the good qualities in every person, but you don't feel a sexual attraction to those qualities. Does that make sense? Whereas when we're not in the connection with our soulmate, we can often be sexually attracted to many persons because we are now seeing the good qualities of the person and it has the effect of opening up some of our addictions which creates a sexual attraction. And, and the reality is there is only one person who God designed you to be sexually attracted to and that's the other half of you. That's the reality. But unfortunately, most people in the spirit world even don't learn about that to the fifth dimension. So, so most people who come and talk to other people on earth about these issues have not learned about the issues either with regard to soulmates and, and how they can be attracted. Uh, and if you find a soulmate and it's married? <laughs> oh. 
you find yourself like... <laughs> I, I, I heard about somebody who, who waited 12 years, she saw him and she thought that was the man. Yeah. And he had small children, like her own sick. She waited until the children became 18 and they didn't come back for 12 years. And after that, when the children were old and they are now happily together for I think 10 years. Yeah. So she really found his, her soulmate, Maurit. Um, maybe you're well, I don't know. What do you do about that? Yes. Well, um, if you love the person, you wouldn't try to interfere with their marriage, would you? Can you see that? Yeah. If I really loved a person and that person was in a relationship, yeah. I wouldn't try to interfere with their relationship. Yeah. However, if I develop my own soul and I release all of the blockages towards the other half of myself, the other half of myself is going to feel that and therefore make changes in their own life mm -hmm. automatically. It's going to automatically happen. Right? Now for somebody to know who their soulmate is and then 25 years later they finish up with them, I suggest that they've taken 25 years to deal with some of those emotions. Whereas they could have done it in six months. Mm -hmm. So it's really up to you as to how you deal with things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, what are you gonna I ask? just wanted to state uh, in the patch chat messages, yep. uh, there's a, a Muslim guy, yep. uh, it has been left out in the Book of Jews, uh, yep. it's from 1914, yep. and uh, he states that uh, in the third sphere there are a lot of Muslim spirits who by themselves felt that they just are attracted to one person, yep. they didn't know of soulmates, but yep. yeah. Yep. So they have a feeling for it. Yes, as you yeah. grow through the dimensions, and we'll talk about this process of growing through the dimensions in terms of love. As you grow through the dimensions, you become more and more convinced that there is only one person for you. Um, and by the time you reach the fifth dimension of the spirit world, generally that conviction has now become a certainty. So for that reason, the majority of people, even if they don't meet their soulmates on earth, will eventually meet their soulmates by the time they hit the fifth dimension of, of their progression in the spirit world. Mm. Okay. Yep. And certainly by the third, you're already opening up quite a lot towards the other half of yourself. And for many people, they start recognising that it has to be somebody else just for me. And of course they observe other relationships and they can see when <coughs> soulmates are together. And so they can see a unique quality that they observe. Yeah? Can you live with your soulmate Yes. There are many people on earth who have lived with their soulmate all their lives and hate their guts. Falling in love process has consequences. Of course it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of which you are a person who has experience. I have a love for my children. Yes. I have different falling in love stories and different families. Yes. Yep. Whose children are they? Uh, God's. God's children. <laughs> <laughs> can you see? Can you see this feeling of ownership is present in us without us even really even admitting to it? Yeah. But for most parents, they go, "My children, my son, uh, my my brothers, my my two, what you would call my sons." That there's a feeling between us of brothers, like because. I don't feel like I can boss them around, whereas you do feel like you can boss your children around still. I, I don't feel like I can tell them what to do. I feel like they have their own lives and I, all, I, all I'm here for is to help them to recognise that God is, their, God is their parent and to help them as best I'm able to, to understand God's laws and principles that affect their lives and, and also to help them as best I'm able to develop a relationship with their real parent. Yes. And this is something I began to do at a fairly young age with my sons. Not my sons, my brothers. So, so the beauty is, if we can do that with our children, we start recognising that they're not our children, but rather our, our, they are our responsibility, because we chose to, to this process of procreation. We chose to invite them into the world. And so therefore we do have a degree of responsibility for their welfare and the outcome. However, if we love them and we care for them, we will give them the best possible means to explore life without our constant bombardment of our expectations and emotions. 
Very important to understand that. When you do that for them, it's amazing how rapidly they develop. If you don't do that, then you will finish up making mini-me's. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, little people who grow up acting like you even though they look, look differently. And in fact, you know, in some cases, as many of you now know, that you've grown through your life, many of you are repeating your, the lives of your mother or father. And this is the, the reason why, is because your mother and father did not allow you to develop yourself. They forced you into a certain process of development, which then, then causes them to feel, or causes you to feel the same way that they feel about certain things. And this is very damaging to your child. Many of you feel the damage of that in your life now. And, and there's a, it's a terrible moment in your life when you sit down and you realise, I've just become my mother, or I've just become <laughs> my father. Right? And when I say it's a terrible moment, it's a terrible moment because you don't know who you are. That's why it's usually a terrible moment. Now, for many of us, we have mothers and fathers who we like, or are proud of, or we feel quite nice people. right? But it still doesn't change that moment when we realise we've become so much like them we can't even realise who we are. That, that's, a, that's a terrible moment in our life, generally. And it requires a lot of humility, remember? The quality of humility to acknowledge that and then work your way through what's going on after that. Okay. How are we doing, babe? Something going on? Sorry, babe. Can I just look? Yeah. We just want to get the recorder. Okay, so we're all right up to this point. These little babies, little conceived children have arrived in the womb of their mothers at this point. We're okay up to there. Any more questions about that? Now, if the pregnancy is terminated, whether it's on purpose or accidentally through a miscarriage or something like that, that person has still individualised. They are now still a spirit body connected with the soul. They pass into the spirit world and they are nursed by people who love them and care for them until you can spend more time with them. Of course, remember yesterday I talked to you about the sleep state. Every time you go to sleep, you're in the spirit world. You, that time you can spend with your child if your child was miscarried. But if your child was aborted, there's a less of a chance of you spending that time with your child because the child felt unwanted by you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But if the child was miscarried, there's a high likelihood when you're in your sleep state that you spend the time nursing your child. Yes? Uh, could you explain about the, uh, our dreams? Now, I've answered that question many times, but briefly, there's just two experiences. One is a dream, which is used to trigger you emotionally so that you can see what you need to work through in your awake state. That is not an actual experience, but rather just a construction of your soul to help you emotionally. The second thing is many dreams are actual experiences in the sleep state. And you can feel the difference between the two. So sometimes you will feel, no, this was an actual experience. Other times you will feel, no, this was just there so that I can feel this emotion that is being triggered within me. Yeah. Okay. okay, so any more questions before we proceed with this process? That all of us are involved in whether we like it or not. <laughs> yeah. No more? So let's see. Take this back down to its uh, original form, which was there. And we get rid of the mum and dad. They're really not that important in the process, with the exception of helping the child come to understand God. So there's the children. The two halves of the soul are now growing. They are, might, one might be in the womb, the other one might be now a baby, and so forth, but they're living on earth. So let's just draw a barrier through there. So this is now what's happening on Earth, in the physical. They still have a spirit body, they have a physical body. Both bodies grow at um, a very similar rate on Earth, but actually the spirit body matures and then the physical body catches up with it. But 
that's the general thing that happens on Earth. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. Okay. So, these children grow up having an experience. Now, some of the experiences are not very pleasant. And some of the experiences they have are very pleasant. Some are love-based experiences, some are fear-based experiences. All of those experiences get absorbed into this soul. So this soul now becomes a combination of things. It has the original personality that God created. And then it has its experiences that its family or its environment helped create initially. And then when it gets its own autonomy, it creates. So some of the experiences are experiences that other people have created, and some of the experiences are experiences that it itself has created. Because of these experiences, it now absorbs certain beliefs. So let's say it grew up in a Catholic family. Right? It might grow up believing that God exists. But after it gets to seven or eight years of age and it watches the little things going on at the church, it might resent going to church right? by that stage. Because it feels like that it's forced into confinement every time it goes to church. So it has its own feelings about that. And so what it does then is it accepts the beliefs that it likes generally and rejects the beliefs that it does not like. So these belief systems are now a part of it. And in the process of its growth, it comes to absorb certain what I would call moral conditions. So morality. So it has morality. In other words, it accepts. Because of it, what it's taught, it accepts that some things are true, some things are not. Some things are moral to do. Like, for instance, it's okay to steal. It might grow up thinking because mum and dad might steal quite frequently, and after a while it feels that it's okay to steal. And on the earth, one thing that most of us grow up with is that it's okay to lie. Right? Because mum and dad lie quite frequently, and particularly, you know, we, we get caught out on that quite young generally, like where we tell the truth that mum and dad wanted us to cover over, and we get a clip over the, get a clip over the ear for that, you know, we get belted for that. And so we learn, no, you don't tell the truth unless mum and dad approve of it. So you learn lots of different things. That's morality. You also learn, as you develop sexually, what, what I would classify as a sexual morality. Sexual development is a very, very important part of your existence. And... Uh, and the morality associated with it is also an important part of your existence. It can negatively or positively affect your life. Not just your life on earth, but your life throughout the spirit world as well. There is still sex in the spirit world, so you are affected by these events that, that cause you to come up with a certain set of behaviours. So can you see what's happening now is there's a whole combination of things which now describe Let's put it together and put it all as one thought it, and call it soul development. Can you see that? You get the whole total of these things, let's call them soul development. So it includes your personality, your experiences, your beliefs, your morality, your sexual morality, your absorption of all these things through the experience of your life. Yes? Okay. So now we've had a life. How long it is, it's very dependent on a number of issues. It's dependent on your emotions, your parents' emotions, and the different experiences and different belief systems and so forth. It also is a bit dependent on where you live on the planet and what goes on in those locations of the planet. So, so for instance, if you're born into a certain location that's very violent, then your life expectancy obviously wouldn't be as long as if you're bor born into a location that's very, very non-violent and, uh, and, and peaceful. But what happens to you is still a part of that development. If you didn't have any emotional errors, at what age would you develop sexually? Mm -hmm. About. 
And, well, there would be no, if you think about it, it really becomes not a sexual issue, but a soulmate issue. So in other words, we would not be sexually attracted to the opposite gender. So for a person who's heterosexual in their attraction, they would not be sexually attracted to the opposite gender. Because they're only sexually attracted to the other half of themselves. So you can see that sexual attraction almost becomes a non-issue. It's more to do with who's your soulmate and the attraction you feel between yourself and the other half of yourself. So it could be like really young. Though. It could be very young that you sexually mature under that definition. Mm. If you meet the other half of yourself and you're completely open to the other half of yourself, then what prevents you? Now if you're asking when does the physical body sexually mature, well, when the soul is at one with God, the physical body matures as the soul desires. So it might take 30 years before you're physically mature, or it might take 15. It just depends on the soul's desire to mature. And that's what happens in the spirit world. Uh, many little babies that, you know, that are miscarried from the earth, or aborted from the earth, um, they sexually mature very slowly, many of them. And many of them might take hundreds of years to sexually mature because it depends on the desire of their soul as to how fast they mature. Mm -hmm. On earth, the reason why, it does still depend on the desire of the soul, but unfortunately the desire of the soul is influenced by the parents. So there is an expectation of both parents that this child sexually matures at a certain age, and because of the expectation of the parents and the environment, generally that's exactly what happens. And the, the emotions of these parents are very, very uh, implicate these, the aspect of sexual maturity. If the parents have an emotion, for example, where a woman can only be a woman when she has a child, then the child, if she's a girl, will absorb that emotion and will mature sexually very early. Yeah. Whereas if the parents have almost the opposite view, that it's great to be independent and, and not have children and, and so forth, and there's no expectation emotionally on the child to sexually develop, then the child may develop uh, sexually in their late teens. And these both can happen next to each other. They can be living next door to each other, where one sexually matures at the age of 10 or 11 or 12, and the other sexually matures at 16, 17 or 18, because of the different emotions in its environment. You understand? Mm -hmm. It's a huge effect. Mm -hmm. The emotions of the environment is the biggest single effect of all sorts of things that occur on the earth, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, uh, the, if, uh, if the mother is uh, quite strong for the son, so, uh, the, so has the type as a man, uh, the guy is not going to take a lot of this masculine uh, natural in him because the woman can be too strong for him. Well, there's two ways that might go. He may become a very arrogant uh, man who feels that all women should serve him. Right? Or he may become a man who becomes very passive and almost feminine as a result of his mother's actions. It just depends on what his mother approves of as to which direction he will probably go in his development. Now, this is where we've got to be very careful with our emotional projections. You see, many of us, like, for example, many of the women in our audience right at the moment have a feeling that men are there to provide them for security first. That's the primary role of a male. Now, that has an effect on your sons. They grow up thinking that men are there to provide security for the woman. Or they grow up thinking they want to get out of that oppression as soon as possible. They do one or the other. Usually they polarise towards one or the other surrounding a certain belief system. Yeah? Now if it was without injury, they wouldn't have the expectation that they would provide security for a woman because they believe that all women can provide security for themselves. But that one emotional injury has already affected many of your sons. And we noticed something in Sweden where the, the boys see, and men seem to have a very, very strong idea that they've got to protect their mothers. They've got to protect women. They've got to look after the woman. And many of the men that we've met just 
walking around, you know, day to day walking around, have had that feeling coming from them. And many of the men justify unloving behaviour of their women as a result. So their women does something that's unloving, and the man justifies the unloving behaviour because he's there to protect her from, you know, even from herself, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. So can you see the question as this began was, when does sexual development occur if, the, if they're open to their soulmates? Well, it's not really a sexual development anymore, it's more of a soulmate development where there's only one person that you're sexually attracted to. So, when, when you first go through this, it's quite strange. Because you, see, you can see people, and you can see some people who are perhaps more beautiful than other people from a physical appearance, and yet you don't feel any attraction for them. Right? And when you go through that process where you're not, you realise that in every single person you met, meet, you're not attracted to, in terms of sexually attracted to. So for five years before I met Mary, that's how I felt. I was not sexually attracted to, to anyone during that time. Yeah. Men, men or women or you know anybody who was pretty or not pretty makes no difference. <laughs> it's just. I, but as soon as I met Mary, I said to a friend of mine, um, "If she's not my soulmate, then I've got a lot more work to do because I'm very attracted, <laughs> because I'm very attracted to her." <laughs> okay. Is there any more questions? So, this is so still life on earth. And uh, if you have a longing for your soulmate, but it has to be, remember, a real one. It can't be one that is manufactured, it can't be something that's fake. It has to be something coming from your heart. See, many of us feel we have a longing for our soulmate, but we have a lot of sadness about how we've been treated by the opposite gender. Well that creates the opposite of a longing for your mate. The sadness of loneliness is another thing that repels your soulmate. You need to feel your loneliness and release it. And then you'll feel completely happy by yourself and that will create a draw for your soulmate. Right? So there's all these different emotions inside of us that cause our soulmate to be repelled from us. And then when we deal with those emotions, our soulmate is attracted to us. And it happens automatically. They don't have to change you. They will be attracted. What if the soulmate dies? If the same thing still occurs. The soulmate is still attracted to the other half of the soul if they deal with their different emotions. And the soul is capable of a relationship with a person in the spirit world. So you are capable in the physical of having a relationship with a person in the spirit world and even having a sexual relationship with a person in the spirit world. So there would be nothing preventing a relationship still. Okay? Also, when the soul mate reaches the point of a one with God, it's capable of materialising a body uh, for extended periods of time, for, for long, long periods of time. And so it's capable of living with you on earth still, in a materialised body of its own creation, uh, in order to engage in a relationship with you. So, so there's no, nothing stopping your soulmate from being with you, whether your soulmate has passed or not passed. Or, yeah. okay. Any other questions before we proceed? There's a fair bit more to go yet. Yeah. What, what are we up to, Tom? Three o'clock. Three o'clock. Two hours. Two hours already. Let's go for another 15 minutes, perhaps, and then have a break. Okay, so we got back to here. This is all happening on the earth. How about that? Don't need that word anymore. So there we go. So we've had a life. Short, long, can be short in the sense of miscarried, or long in the sense we lived to a ripe old age of 155. Right. In history, there are some people that have lived almost 1,000 on earth. Okay, and we'll talk about why if you want to know why. But, uh, then we pass, we pass, and where we pass is dependent completely upon our soul development. So remember I wrote this term soul development on the board, and it was the sum total of all of these different things, beliefs, emotions, feelings, and so forth. And the biggest effect of the soul development 
is the condition of love, truth, and humility. That we are in. Now some people have almost no humility when they pass, and very little love in them when they pass, and no understanding of the truth when they pass. And as a result, they've taken many actions that have been very unloving on the planet, and as a result of that, they pass into a very dark location of the spirit world. One thing, one thing I feel that is very dangerous to accept from the New Age movement is this, that when we all pass, we all become automatically enlightened. That when we all pass, we automatically know all things. These are very, very dangerous concepts, and they are definitely not true. I've spoken to many thousands, hundreds of thousands of spirits from Earth, and millions of spirits in the spirit world, over the course of my life, and almost every single one of them believed at some point in their history that when they passed, they'd know everything or know nothing at all. One of the two. In other words, know nothing at all in that, in that when they're dead, they're dead. And then, or they believe that they know, they know everything. And both things are false. When you're dead, you're not dead. You're still alive. And although you're still alive, you know one more thing than you knew before the moment you died. And that is that you're still alive. Does that make sense? That's all you know. More than what you knew the moment before you died. Right? And that makes sense, doesn't it? How can you automatically get a download of information in the universe without there being something involved for yourself? It makes sense that you have to learn it. Because that's what you've had to do all your life. So, this concept that people have, that when I'm dead, I will know everything, is very false, and it's also very damaging. Because a lot of people pass over into the spirit world thinking they should know everything. They know nothing more than they already knew. And then they become very confused and very upset, and they don't know what to do about it. They don't know who to find out about their changing condition from. Now, other people come to them, but it's like sometimes mumbo jumbo. You know, sometimes you can hear a person speaking. So, for instance, if a scientist comes to speak with you and he starts quoting all the mathematical formula involved in the process of radiation decay, for most of you here, it would be like blah, 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 blah. Like, like, as if like nothing's being said or. Totally not understandable for the majority of us, right? He understands exactly what he's saying. He understands exactly what he's doing. But, but we don't understand. And it's exactly the same process that happens with much of our existence when we pass. If we are not open to the concept, if we're not humble, we haven't learned humility, then what happens is that we are very close to what people say to us. And you'll often hear in the spirit world people saying, look, they're saying these things to me, but I don't get them yet. <laughs> I don't understand what this means. And, and this is an issue that we face when we pass. We often don't understand what people who are trying to help us mean, because we've not got a concept of anything that they're speaking of. So when we pass, we pass based on our soul development. Now, historically, there are some people that have passed, and the person who's passed to the highest condition possible so far, and it doesn't have to be this way, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dimensions. And remember, there's 22 of these, so I'll draw some more. Remember, yesterday I said the seventh was a barrier, and that's the barrier where you become at one with God. And the sixth was a barrier, and that's the barrier where that's the most you can progress through your own reliance, self-reliance. So that's a self-reliant, natural love place, and then you can continue progressing in love if you receive love from God. Now, historically, most people pass into the first dimension, and that is still happening. Most people who ever pass on the earth pass into the first dimension. And in fact, they pass in, in the first dimension, there are literally thousands of layers in the first dimension. And the bottommost layers are what are referred to as the hells of the spirit world. 
And you'd be surprised how many people do still pass into the hells of the spirit world. There are literally <laughs> billions of people in that first dimension, still sitting in that first dimension, yet to progress. Then, some people, very rare for people to pass into the second dimension, and historically, only a handful of people have passed into the third. Okay. What do you do when you live in those dimensions? Do you just continue living your life as you always <coughs> Remember oh, yesterday I spoke of desire. <coughs> One of the things to bear in mind is that your life is going to be completely in the future governed by your desires and passions. So you do what you want to do. Now if you haven't got any ideas of what you want to do, then you won't be doing much at all. But if you have a large variety of ideas of all the things you want to do, then you might be doing hundreds of things. It just depends on what you want to do. So for example, some of you may be fascinated with finding out about scientific things. When you pass, it's highly likely that you will continue that investigation. Some of you might be very fascinated with language and literature and other things. But when you pass, it's highly likely you will continue with those investigations. It depends on what you want to do as to what you will do. And how fast you progress will also depend on how fast you want to progress. It won't depend on any other thing. It will depend on how quickly you can absorb new truth and how quickly you want to absorb new truth. The more resistive you are and the more less humble you are, it will be a very, very slow process. There are many spirits who are with us here today listening to this talk who are still in the hills after thousands of years of being there because they have been not humble to the process at all and they don't, a lot of them don't even believe you can progress. They don't even believe there's a second dimension. Because their personal experience is, after thousands of years, there's no second dimension, because I've never had one. And they see different people leaving, and they think they're dying, or they think they're reincarnating. They don't understand that they're going to the second dimension. Right? So they think things are happening to them that are not even happening. Sometimes they see people disappear, right, almost in front of their eyes. And they feel that, that something bad has happened to them. So they even become more afraid. <laughs> That's what happens. So, so the desires you have will guide what happens to you in the spirit world. This is why it's so important for you to develop desire now while you're on the earth. Yeah. So, so what if we leave it there for the moment and then we'll continue with arrival in the spirit world and what happens during the spirit world in terms of your progression. Shall we do that? Mm -hmm. Darling, you... Babe, I just wanted to mention something, just in the interest of truth. Yeah. Uh, it took me a while to catch on, but I believe Michael was implicating me in uh, the criticism of you earlier when he said that a woman very close to you had said that you'd spoken too much about the other side of the board. Was it you that you were referring to, Michael? Yeah. 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 I, I certainly didn't feel critical of you. I just remarked that both you and I do love to talk about humility, uh, truth and love, and that I personally find the... I pointed out that the audience kept drawing you back to the metaphysical discussion and that I personally don't enjoy metaphysics as much as I find joy in the other three. So it was in no way critical of you and I feel that you used that as a way to criticise AJ. So, yeah. I just, you, know, you could discuss that. Yeah, but because it was done publicly oh, okay. and, and I didn't even realise because I didn't feel critical, I thought okay. I'd address it publicly. No worries. Well, let's uh, have a break for, should we do a half an hour like we did yesterday again? Mm -hmm.